I don't know about you guys, but I'm totally intimidated. <laughs> we, uh, we are at the other end of the scale. We're sort of your backyard land trust and uh, part of a, a group of organizations across the United States that are working in communities and at, at the local scale uh, to try to be part of that 50%. We're trying to figure out how you, you work back uh, towards wildness from a state of, uh, of development, you know, sometimes urban, but, but often sort of halfway. So I'm going to show you a few things. I, I can't do this in less than 40 minutes, so this is a very <laughs> truncated version. Um, Piedmont Environmental Council, the land trust, uh, works in nine counties uh, in the Virginia Piedmont. It's a multi-generational effort. This is a landscape that's owned by private citizens in a state that was created as a mercantile colony to exploit land and resources, and we believe in property rights. This is a community that voted 70% for Donald Trump. <laughs> and thinks that climate change is not that important. Four percent of the population, when we polled them in September, thought that climate change was an issue of importance. So that's who we work with. But with these people, and in a lot of, across a lot of issues, we've done incredible partnerships around conservation. So even in that challenging political and sociological reality, a lot of good is possible, and that's why I'm still optimistic. These are a, a class of uh, college students we train every summer. Uh, we bring them in as smart juniors and seniors from across colleges in the United States and try to re-educate them because they haven't learned a thing. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of those kids have paid taxes? What do you think? Less than 10% of them have ever filed a tax return. None of them knows what a deed is. None of them can conceive of what a mortgage is. <laughs> and so they don't understand the drivers for most decisions that are made by local governments who, in fact, oh, sorry, along with private citizens, are the ones who make most of the decisions that determine environmental quality. So we have these really brilliant conservationists who know nothing. And so we start, and do, start them over. And it's not that they don't care. They care a lot. They can sit and see beautiful landscapes and be in passion but they have to learn more about how, how decisions and, and communities make decisions. So first things first, what's the Piedmont? We have to teach them a little bit about where we are, what's, what our geology is. We don't work in that entire foothills of the Blue Ridge and the Alleghenies, uh, but we are in this landscape of highly eroded ancient mountains, uh, lots of fractures and, and no giant aquifers. We've got little po pockets of water and lots of, lots of complications. This is our little piece. You're here. Uh, we're out there. We're about 50 miles from one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in North America. So it's a challenging environment to be doing 50% uh, conservation. We're known for our cattle. You know, we raise really good grass-fed beef. Uh, beautiful views. The, the, Apple, the, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains are very, very famous in American cultural landscape. Uh, the Shenandoah National Park, one of our first national parks, condemned by the state from private citizens. And one of our projects is to work with the communities of families that were driven out of the park, many of whom were never compensated. Think about that. Um, and they still live there. It's only two, or three, four generations away. There are, you know, there are relatives who remember being taken out of the park. So that's part of, our, part of our landscape that we have to work with. The Appalachian National Scenic Trail, one of the great, great tools for bringing people to nature, and we have some of the most heavily traveled portions of it. Uh, great his, history. This is the landscape that inspired Jefferson and Madison to write the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So great sense of social justice and liberty. Obviously, some things we're still working on. Uh, <laughs> But basic concept of participatory democracy and place where change can happen. A place of great conflict and of great passion. We have many, many of the Civil War battlefields from the American Civil War uh, where literally hundreds of thousands of people uh, died and many were buried. So it's a place of great emotion. And it's also a great place with a great and vibrant agricultural economy. And traditionally a commodity exporter and one of our biggest struggles is creating local and regional food networks because almost all of the food produced in Virginia 
through history was exported out of the, of the state. We have great waters uh, that, that rise from the, from the mountains and provide habitat for our charismatic megafauna, the northern brook trout. <laughs> that's it. That's all I got. It's eight inches long. It's really beautiful. Uh, but it's not an oryx. It's not a happy penguin. It's a, <laughs> So I apologize, but uh, drinking water for millions of, uh, of people and, in, in, again, in a very fast-growing area. So what's our role in this? We have to continually educate, generation by generation, uh, a population that's growing that now represents 140 different countries. I mean, our public schools teach English as a second language to 30 different languages. So this is a very complex and increasingly diverse uh, community. And the first challenge is to engage them. Now, for your average seventh generation Virginia farmer, conserving a Civil War battlefield is pretty straightforward. It's where their ancestors fought and died. But explaining that from someone who came from Sudan is a little different. It's not quite as a direct connection. And so, you know, finding points of engagement is the thing. And so what we try to do is find as many as possible the multiplicity of, of points of entry to our organization, and which, which is why we work on almost every issue, from energy and transportation all the way through uh, habitat restoration and wildlife preservation. Education is continuous. What's so interesting is to, to realize that every generation knows nothing when they start. You know, we know that, we know that with our own kids. You, you sort of see them go from zero to this amazing point where they pass you at about 16. <laughs> uh, but that, that reminder every summer with the college students that they really don't know anything about local government is a rude reminder of how important this is. Every time we elect a new board of supervisors at our local county council, we got to go back to square one. What is a watershed? Why is it important? You know, where does your drinking water come from? 75% of Americans have no idea, <coughs> right? So, so that idea of education is not a one-time thing where, yep, we did it, it's done, we can move on to the next thing. It's something you have to build in as a recurring thing. And then this last thing, empowerment. How can we give pe people things to do they can do directly, right? It's great to talk about policy. It's great to have billionaires give parks. But we have millions of people that need to be able to do smaller and more concrete things so they too feel like they own that solution. Again, around a broad set of issues and working with literally thousands of people, but also hundreds of organizations around uh, all those issues. So I'm going to zoom in on two things where I think you might find something you can take away. Around land conservation, again, we're a, a land trust. We're part of the Land Trust Alliance. We're accredited. We know how to do conservation easements and complex deals and all that stuff. But what does that add up to? Well, here's our landscape in 19... Uh, oh, well, that went very quickly. You can see it filling in. That's literally thousands of people taking the decision to permanently restrict their largest asset with a permanent deed restriction that limits subdivision and ensures conservation of, of important conservation values. If you think about that as a public-private partnership, it is amazing. It represents about $4 billion in private wealth that's been given up, and it is a uh, ongoing endeavor. We, we do about 100 easements a year, working from a pool of about 1,000 of people who show interest. And again, that's something that's going forward. Our goal is a million acres out of a two million acre landscape, which is what? 50%. And it's all buffers to the national park. In fact, it's the view shed, that, it's the beautiful views that you see from the national park. The views you see are not actually the national park land. And that's true for this, the, the Appalachian Trail as well. Those brown spots are historic districts because we found that identifying with cultural landscape is as important as anything else. These easements really add up. When you aggregate them, this was done by my GIS, GIS team, pretty cool, it's double the size of the park itself. So that's pretty amazing. And one, two generations with thousands of partners protecting twice as much land as was condemned without compensation 75 years earlier. So that's a real success story. 
And it's, it's important stuff. It's riparian buffers on 1,600 miles of streams and rivers, and all those da the data points. You know, 30,000 acres of Civil War battlefields, that's just an amazing concentration uh, of American history. And it's not inconsistent <coughs> with the long-term community visions for growth. These are the, so this is sort of the correspondence between our growth areas uh, and the conservation areas in a very broad way. This is Dulles Airport. This is Eastern Loudoun, which is, the, is growing at about between 5 and 12 percent per year in its population. So this is not going on in a landscape where nothing's going on. Now, out here, you have what we call hollows, hollers that haven't changed much in 200 years. And that's all in a transect of about 40 miles. So pretty neat landscape, but in the night sky, it's pretty, pretty stark. The places where there's growth, you see the lights. The places that are conserved that are dark. So it's a good measure, I think, of success. And that's a result of partnership, again, between this community of private landowners who have said this is what we want, and local governments that are working with them, state and federal governments that help with that as well. This isn't going to show up as well because of the film. But when you, <laughs> when you look at it from aerial views, the counties where there's a strong civic movement for conservation and where there's not, uh, it really shows up. Uh, there's, this, this projector isn't bright enough to show it. So what does this all have to do with partnership? Every one of these things takes ongoing work at the local, regional, state, national, and global level. We're, we're always trying to find new ways to bring new people in, new resources, because none of it would happen one by one by one. Uh, it all relies on this sort of sense of mutual trust. Uh, go back to those easements. You can't get one unless you believe your neighbor will ultimately do one. And what is the funniest thing to watch is sort of the what we call the relentless incrementalism of, of conservation, where the neighborhood starts to peer pressure itself, right? And we think the tipping point is very much like it is for most social change movements, about 15%. When the early adopters become 10, 15% of the land or the landowners, <laughs> then it becomes cool. And if you're not in, then you're not cool. And then you quickly go from 15% to 20, 30, 40, 50%. Actually, in the rural areas, we're looking for something closer to 70%. And that's when we know we'll have success, uh, and we don't think we're that far away. So again, the brook trout, part of a big uh, set of watersheds, the Chesapeake, uh, the Rappahannock River. And what we're trying to do here is extend the cold water habitat we've recreated with the Shenandoah National Park, which was all pasture. It's all bare pasture when it was formed, and now is 75, 80 years of timber. And bring that down further. Uh, create connectivity, extend habitat. And one of the things we identified were stream crossings that were blocking the migration of this giant fish. Uh, we had to go out and assess it. We had all these partners. We had to give it the third party credibility, get the landowners to let us on site. But it's things like this. And there are about 150 of them. And we got to get them out, and then we got to replace them with something better. And that takes time and lots of partners, two and a half years. All the Fish and Wildlife Service people had maternity leave in between. It, just, it was amazing what can slow you down. Um, but then it happens. And you release that water behind that dam that was a road that someone didn't really think through the first time. Everybody's happy. They smile. The trout are happy. The people are happy. And the park is effectively expanded. And so that's one thing that we really think is the, the takeaway. People really love where they live. That same poll that showed only 4% of the people were worried about climate change showed that 75% thought that quality life was what was important to them the most. More than taxes, more than schools, more than crime, it was quality of life. And if we can get them to understand what they can do to improve quality of life, whatever the starting point is, they will build towards that 50%, that rest restoration of wildness, and create the places that we all think are, are important. And so that's why we're still optimistic, even though we live at the edge of this crazy place. Thank you. Thank you.